right, so we've got the most modern of pulpits here. Uh, so, I'm excited for tonight. I'm excited for what the Holy Spirit is about to do. It was fun what He did today in the morning and the afternoon, but I believe the Lord has more. So one of the things I feel like I'm supposed to do tonight is to share with you really one of my favorite, one of my favorite sort of teachings, and it is on what is the purpose of tongues. You can all take your seat if you want. So it's over the purpose. What is the purpose of tongues? Why do we pray in tongues? Why do we, why are we baptized in the Holy Spirit? What does it do for us? I grew up in a church that taught that it wasn't for today. But then as I, you know, I've, as I've gone to other churches and ministered in other places, I've met so many different believers, even in charismatic and Pentecostal type churches that will say things like, well, it's for you, but I don't have that gift. Referring to the gift of praying in tongues and talking in tongues. And some that will say, well, it's, you know, it's for certain people. When I got baptized in the Holy Spirit and I came back to my home church, the pastors were really trying to figure out what to do with me. Because they didn't want to kick me out because I've been in that church all my life. And they didn't know what to do with me exactly. And so finally they, they reached a conclusion, well, this, this must be a gift, a diversity of tongues for missionaries. So missionaries must need this gift, but the rest of us don't. So that stopped the spread of it in the local church. But the reality is, let's see what the Bible actually has to say about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and about the gifts of the Spirit. So in the Old Testament, what did it say about the Holy Spirit? What did we say about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Book of Joel, chapter 2, 28 through 30 says, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your, your, your old, your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And upon my servants and my handmaidens in those days, I will pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. So here we have in the old Testament, we have the Holy Spirit promising to send his fire to come upon us in a new way. And this is the pro this is what the pro this is what Peter references on the day of Pentecost. Because of the day of Pentecost, he referenced the book of Joel and he said this thing that's happening now is what was prophesied by Joel. So let's look at what Joel said. He said in the latter days, how long have we been in the latter days since Jesus, since Pentecost? We've been in the latter days. Don't, you know, a lot of people are so scared about what, where are we in the end times? The reality is we've been in the latter days. We've been in the end times since Jesus. So we've been in the end times. We're in the latter days. We're in the end days. I don't know where we are in the end days. You can figure that out on your own. But the reality is we're in the end days. And so in the latter days, he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. All flesh. It's amazing about this gift of tongues is that it is so it is across the body of Christ. Everywhere you go, there are people speaking in tongues. In every nation you go to, there are believers that speak in tongues. It, but and the the reality is and there's some places where where we've seen the power of God manifest in incredible ways. I've oftentimes seen God move and and give the gift of tongues to people at the moment they receive Christ. We have a lot of gang, former gangsters and former uh, drug dealers and very violent people, people that came out of witchcraft. And almost immediately, they receive, when they receive Christ, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens so soon because they're very spiritually aware. So the reality is this is for all flesh. This is for all people. God wants to baptize us in the Holy Spirit. He wants to fill us with the Holy Spirit. So today you guys experience, some of you guys experience the fire of God. And the fire of God is so powerful. But the fire of God is unto a purpose. So that we will begin to be transformed into the image of Christ. So we begin to be converted into the very image of Christ. And that fire of God accomplishes this in multiple different ways. So one of the things with the gift of tongues, he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. This means it's for everyone. It means it's for men and for women. Your young men will dream, or young men, old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. So it's for both the young and the old. I remember my, my mother who grew up Methodist. She grew up in a church where she didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. When I came back from Africa, I was so excited. I was on fire. And I came back and I told my family I was fully expecting to lay hands on them and them to all get slain in the spirit in the living room. And it didn't work out quite that way. They thought I joined a cult. And so it, it scared them a little bit. So I came and I, I started telling my family about the Holy Spirit. And I remember finally my mother said, listen, 
this is good for you, but this is not for me. You're young, I'm old. So I took her to this passage. I said, old men will, old and women, old men and old women will dream dreams. Meaning that the Holy Spirit wants to be poured out on people irregardless of where, of what your, your age, your socioeconomic status. It talks about on my servants, I will pour out the Spirit. So you see, we're seeing the power of God poured out. So let's look at this in the New Testament now. In the New Testament, in the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 17. We're going to spend a little time here. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place. And there suddenly came out of heaven as a mighty rushing wind, a sound, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there were appeared upon them divided tongues as of fire, and one and a tongue sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout men and women from every devout men from every nation. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together, and they were confused. Because everyone had heard them speak in their own language. When they were amazed and they marveled to one another saying, Look, not, aren't, aren't all of these men who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we each hear them in our own language in which we were born? And it goes through all the different linguistic groups. There's f- between 15 and 16 different languages represented at the day of Pentecost. And so it goes to the, I'm not going to read all the language groups, but it says we each heard them speaking in our own tongue and declaring the wonderful works of God. So as they were all amazed and perplexed, they said to one another, whatever does this mean? But others were mocking and they said, these men are just full of the new wine. But Peter stood up with the 11 and he raised his voice to them and he said, men of Judea and all you who dwell in Jerusalem. Let it be known to you and heed my words, for these men are not drunk as you suppose. Hey, the, the third, this is only the third hour of the day. But what has been spoken by the prophet Joel, it says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And you know the rest of the story. And 3,000 were added to their number. There's a little bit of a trend I've seen in especially Western churches where we try to tone down the Holy Spirit. I don't think that's really a problem at harvest school. (laughs) But some of you may have come out of a bit more, we'll call it a a seeker-friendly type of church. Where it's, you know, maybe it's a charismatic church, but there's, it's a little bit more reserved. And that's the thing, you know, that we, we respect all in the body of Christ. But the reality is, let's look at how Jesus chose to found his church. Because this week I'm going to talk more with you more about church planting. So if we're going to talk about church planting, let's look at what the very first church looked like. How did Jesus choose to found his church? Modern day wisdom of church planting is this. You get a big building and you fill it with nice people that can give lots of money. (laughs) And you bring the people together and you try your very best not to scare them away. Not to scare them away, not to be too charismatic, not to be too out there. And if you're going to have some a charismatic core in your church, they need to be praying in tongues back in some room hidden away in the back of the church. Because God forbid that the new believers see people praying in tongues and become confused. But let's look a little bit at what happened at Pentecost. So at Pentecost, they all came together and they're up in the upper room. And the Holy Ghost comes upon them. And with like a mighty rushing wind. You know, we, there's all this talk about God as a gentleman. He won't do to you, you know, anything that you're not asking for. The day of Pentecost, he came and he kicked the door in. Sometimes the Holy Spirit comes as a gentle voice. And I'll tell you, oftentimes he does. And we need to learn to listen to the gentle voice of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes he wants to kick the door in. And he, in order to kick the door in, we need to stand back and say, God, what do you desire to do? He desires to break through. He shows up and there it blows up. We've oftentimes seen the Holy Spirit move. Whoa, I was preaching in a, in a, like a rehab center in Washington state area. And they invited me in to speak at this, this rehab, Christian rehab center. And I didn't know it, but the, that was a very conservative sort of, uh, center where they didn't have, they didn't believe in speaking in tongues and things like that. They didn't warn me of that. So I went in full 
this. And if you can imagine, I walked in the rehab center and my wife and I were sharing with, it was the women's side of the rehab. We came in and I just walked in and I, and during they were playing a song on the guitar and all of a sudden I just started singing in tongues, shut up and people started falling over and manifesting demons. And so I started casting demons out of people. Well, about that time, one of the, one of the directors freaks out. And so she sees this happening and she immediately takes off running. And long story short, I got called into the director's office. And, uh, they, and there's people vomiting on the floor. We're casting demons out of people. People are getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. I had no idea that I just kicked a hornet's nest. And so they call me into the office and the director is in there and he's laughing. And he's just laughing. And, and I was like, so... What did I do? Did I break something? Did I, did I break your church? I'm sorry. I, like, I didn't mean to. And he said, oh, you freaked everybody out. But he said, the ones that, that are on the floor that got delivered are excited about it. But the ones who uh, were t- took off running, they were so confused. They came in here to try to get me to come and kick you out. But he said, I need to tell you my testimony. He said, and, and so he'd been in this organization a long time. But he said, when I first got saved, or back before I was saved, he said, before he was saved... He was a a drug addict and he was an atheist. And he wandered into a Pentecostal church. And he came into this Pentecostal church not believing in God at all. Sat in the back of this Pentecostal church. And the pastor got up and kept giving and gave an altar call at the end of the message. He said, I thought there was a ridiculous message, ridiculous group of people. I wanted nothing to do with it. And the, but the pastor kept, he wouldn't shut up. He kept giving this altar call saying, if you want to give your heart to Christ. Finally, he was like, you know, I'm just going to go up there to make this guy stop talking. Because he didn't want to leave. He was trapped by the ushers. He didn't want to leave. But he was like, I'm just going to go up there to make this guy stop talking. So anyway, so he comes up to the front. He thought they would like pat him on the back or something. He said, no, all these Pentecostal elders got around me and started praying in this tongues. In in a language I'd never heard before. But he said this, and I've never forgotten this. He said, I was an atheist. But he said, they laid hands on me and began to pray in this language. And for the first time in in my entire life, I felt God and I knew he was real. So there's something about praying in tongues that actually it's very raw and it's very real. It's a manifestation, a raw manifestation of the Holy Spirit among us. So you look at what happened at Pentecost. Their model of church planting was the Holy Spirit came upon the believers, 120 in the upper room. They were crying out to God. He comes in like a mighty wind. He puts fire upon their head. It was a reversal of the curse of Babylon. Or, sorry, curse of, of Babel. It was a reversal of the curse of Babel. Because at Babel, the languages were divided. But at Pentecost, God brought unity again to the languages through the Holy Spirit. And all of them heard the gospel in their own language. And it was amazing that it was, it was the sign of it was fire over their heads. That they had fire. So when God reversed the curse of Babel... He put fire upon their heads, divided tongues of fire over their heads. There's so much prophetic semblance of the fire. You read the the Old Testament and the New Testament. All throughout, there's the theme of God putting His fire, reversing a curse and putting His fire upon the church. Putting His fire upon men and women to fill them with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. One of the misconceptions is that people think that the Holy Spirit is going to grab your tongue and force you to speak in tongues. So if you've never spoken in tongues before, some of you maybe are you're thinking, well, you know, this gift of tongues, I'm just going to wait till some sound comes out of me. But the reality is the Bible says they spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. When we speak in tongues, it is us speaking, but it's the Spirit giving the words. So it is a partnership with the Holy Spirit. And we'll get it more into that in a minute. But it is a partnership with the Holy Spirit whereby we pray and the Holy Spirit gives us the words. We pray the words of heaven. It bypasses the mind. It's not a prayer from the mind. It's not even a prayer from the heart. It's a prayer from the Spirit. It's a prayer from the very depth within us where the depth of God cries out to the depth within us. And we pray and it comes out of us in a language that we don't know. So at the day of Pentecost, they began to speak in tongues. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And it said, and a multitude came together, and they were confused. This is Jesus' model for church planting. Confuse everybody. Think, think about it for a minute. This is exactly the opposite of how old people teach church planting. You don't want to scare or confuse the new believers. I want to tell you something about revival. One of the things we teach our leaders, never stop a move of the Holy Spirit. 
Never stop when the Holy Spirit is moving, but pastor the people whom God is moving on. So you don't ever have to apologize. Never apologize for the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes they need to be explained. So what happened was the people came together and they were confused. The reality is God will oftentimes confuse the head so he can get to the heart. God oftentimes will need to offend your mind so he can speak to your heart and to your spirit. And oftentimes the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, why, why there's so many different manifestations, shaking, rolling, running, whatever it may be, speaking in tongues. Sometimes these signs and these wonders are there to remind us that he's God and we're not. And the manifestations of the Holy Spirit are there to get our attention. Oftentimes it will confuse us, but if you'll ask him, Lord, what are you doing in this? He'll, he'll speak to you and say what it is. When the Lord encountered me and I began to shake uncontrollably, I said, God, what are you doing? The Lord said, I want to shake you. I want to shake things out of you that have been a stronghold to you. He make it clear. So these people at Pentecost, they came together and they heard them in their own language. Now this is kind of a, a misconception. A lot of people think that they were each speaking a different dialect, but the Bible actually says they each heard them all speak in their own language. So it wasn't like someone was speaking Aramaic, someone was speaking, you know, some Hebrew, someone was speaking another. No, every ethnic group heard the gospel in their own language. So not only was it a gift of tongues, but it was also a supernatural gift of interpretation. I was in Honduras um, a couple years back, and we have a, a new base in Honduras. And I was going to visit uh, one of the villages there. It was in a village that were, the tribe was called Garifano. And so I was going through the village and just, just praying in tongues, just like I do all the time. And going through the village, just we were looking to plant a church. I speak Spanish, but I don't speak the dialect they spoke in that, um, in that village. They spoke, a, it's actually an African language because they're, the Garifanos are escaped or the former slaves that had escaped from the Caribbean. And so they speak an African dialect. They wear African clothes. It's a, it's a fairly large ethnic group in Honduras. And so that I, don't, I don't speak their language. Then I spoke Spanish. And so I'm walking through the village. We didn't have a church there yet. But we were just walking through and just praying. And I was just praying. Praying in tongues. And all of a sudden, two girls come running out of the house. And they chase me down the street. And they come to us and they say to me in Spanish, they're like, we heard you praying. And we understood you in our language. And we understood what you were saying, that you were calling us. And to one girl, she heard that he was calling her to come and be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The other girl he the, heard the Holy Spirit speak to her and say that he was calling her to come and be healed because she had a chronic stomach issue. We laid hands on them both and they were laid out in the Spirit. One girl, not praying in tongues, and the other one healed completely. And the power of God came and then the villagers started coming out and wondering why we killed these two girls. And because they're just no explanation, just laid out in the street. And then we began to preach. So first, the people come together and they're confused. It's a model for church planting. Sometimes this is what a church plant will look like. You need to look for the opportunities, the divine opportunities within the Holy Spirit chaos. For what is, what is God looking to establish? There was one time I was praying over, it was in South Mexico, and I was doing an event in South Mexico. And uh, prayed over, I was praying over people, and a man came up who I knew. I knew him, and he was part of one of our churches. So I prayed for him, and, you know, and just in, in tongues. I didn't pray, give him any kind of word in Spanish. Just prayed for him in tongues. The next day, he comes to me. I was staying at the pastor's house, and he comes over, and he tells me, he said, Pastor, everything you told me came true. I looked at him, and I said, I didn't prophesy anything over you. And he said, you prophesied over me, and you said that tomorrow morning I would get a promotion. And then I, and my, I would get a promotion in my job and I was going to move, be moved to another part of Mexico where I would then go and establish a church. He said, I assume the next, this morning, first thing I got called in and told that I had, I was being promoted. I was being given a pay raise and I was being moved to another part of the country. I looked at him. I was shocked. I had, I promise you, I did not say any of that. Even though I speak Spanish, when I prayed in tongues, what the spirit spoke through me was that. So sometimes when you speak in an unknown tongue, God will do signs and wonders through you that you can't even imagine. So the people came together and they were confused. And they looked and they said, how are these men who are Galileans speaking in our own language? And then others said, oh, these men are just full of the new wine. 
They're drunk. It's amazing. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will draw a line in the sand. He actually, we talk about the Holy Spirit bringing division, but oftentimes the move of the Holy Spirit first actually brings a separation. But, and he draws a separation. He draws a dividing, uh, dividing line based on the heart condition of people's hearts. Some people heard the gospel being preached in their language. To those that had a desire to hear, who had ears to hear, heard it in their own language. Others heard the babbling of drunk men. Think about this for a minute. Same crowd, same people. Some heard the gospel. Others heard drunk, drunk men speaking. There's two points to draw out of that. Number one, drunkenness in the spirit is nothing new. It's nothing unique to the renewal. It's nothing unique to Iris. This has been going on since Pentecost. So you can rest assured if you fall on the floor laughing under the power of God, they didn't think they were drunk because they were speaking in tongues. When you hear someone speaking in another language, you don't think they're drunk. You go through an airport, you hear people speaking in Hindi, you don't think, oh, these men are drunk. No, you just think they're from India. You walk through, you hear another language, you don't automatically think they're drunk. Why would they think they were drunk? Because they were rolling probably on the floor, they were laughing, they were falling over, they were doing what drunk people do. And the power of God was being poured out on the church. And they were almost in their own little world. But the people were coming and looking and going, what is going on? And to those whose hearts had been prepared, they heard the word of the Lord. But to those whose hearts were not being prepared, had not been prepared, who had hardened hearts, they only heard the babbling of drunk men. Actually, when the Holy Spirit shows up, there will be people who have positive reactions to the move of the Holy Spirit and people who have negative reactions to the move of the Holy Spirit. We've had, I can't tell you how many times we've had people come into our meetings and look and have their eyes about as big as, you know, big as saucers looking at what's going on and then take off running. Because the move of the Holy Spirit is oftentimes, if you're not prepared, if people's hearts are not prepared, it's scary. Then there, we've had others who came in. Actually, we had one lady who was a witch who came into our service. We've had this multiple times, but we had a witch come into our service. Uh, and she came in, and I had a word of knowledge that God wanted to heal someone with, a, with chronic pain throughout their body. And they had it for years. She comes to the front, and she had been in witchcraft all her life and never set foot in a Christian church. And she came up to the front. And we, we didn't ask her any questions. We just touched her and the power of God came on her and she said she felt electricity go through her body and she falls out under the power of God. And she gets up and she says, what did you do to me? And she said, oh, she said, I have no pain. She was confused. And she told us, she said, I'm a witch. She said, I came here for another reason. But she said, when the power of God healed me, I'm going to follow your God because your God has power. Your God has true power. See, when we walk in the power of the Spirit, there is a supernatural atmosphere hey, that gets created. I was speaking at a harvest school one time, and I was praying for people. And as I was praying for, it was one of the, I'd just gotten to Pemba. It was back when it was in Pemba, I think two years ago, three years ago. And I was just going and praying over people. And by the time I got to the 200th something person, I was kind of tired and I didn't run out of steam and run out of words. And so I just laid hands on this lady and I just prayed for her in, in tongues. And afterwards she grabs my hand and she said, where did you learn Hebrew? And I looked at her. I said, what? I said, I don't speak Hebrew. I said, I speak a couple of languages, but Hebrew is not one of them. And she said, I'm Israeli. She said, you speak an old dialect of Hebrew. And I understood it. She said, you were prophesying over me in Hebrew, and this is what she said. Do, 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 do. She gave me the word of what had been said. See, when you pray in tongues, supernatural things will happen. Supernatural things happen in the meetings when we have spirit-led meetings, where we have meetings where the Holy Ghost is moving in power. Oftentimes, we try to relegate the move of the Holy Spirit in praying in tongues to the prayer closet, but there is a public use for this gift as well. And oftentimes the public use for this, this gift is where there'll be tongues and the Holy Spirit himself will give an interpretation to the new believer. But if we often, you know, many people are afraid, they say, you quote Paul and they say, well, what about order? What about order in the church? I said, well, look at Pentecost. Pentecost was God's idea of order. Think about it. Pentecost was God's, it was a spirit, literally a Holy Spirit led service. 
and the Holy Spirit. It was his inauguration of the church. And look at how he chose to do it. So what what was Paul doing? Paul was just trying to bring a little bit of stability to the church and saying, you know, when there's messages and tongues, there should also be interpretation. Because he was actually bringing them back to this. Because at the day of Pentecost, there was both tongues and interpretation. It was fully supernatural. It was fully Holy Spirit move. Hey, there's balance for everything in the church. But God is calling us back to a place of living a life in the Spirit. And one of the things I think that the Western church can learn from the African church, that I learned from the African church, is what it's like to live a life in the Spirit. What it's like to live a life of praying in tongues. I was told you guys had a good experience with some of the African brothers praying in in tongues. I think this is, I'm telling you, I learned about praying in the Spirit from Africans. And when I, I, one of the things I believe is that that is something that God has, is doing in the African church that He wants to bring to the Western church. I've been in charismatic Pentecostal meetings one, one where there are people who don't speak in tongues anymore. I remember I was doing a conference for Pentecostal pastors and I'm, I'm just a lowly Baptist and I'm thinking, you know, these Pentecostals, they've had the Holy Ghost since Azusa and I'm doing this conference for these Pentecostal pastors and the Holy Spirit tells me, I want you to teach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm thinking, isn't this like going back to kindergarten for these guys? These guys, they're, they're Pentecostals. They, they're Pentecostal pastors. Suit, tie, everything like that. I'm thinking, these are real Pentecostals. Southern Pentecostals. And I was going to speak to this group of guys. So I talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Pastors were coming forward, getting laid out under the power of God, speaking in tongues. Some of them coming and saying, I hadn't spoken in tongues in 30 years. Some of them were saying, I haven't done this in all these years. I want to tell you, I believe that it's very dangerous in the church when we have a gift, when we have a knowledge, when we received a revelation, but we no longer choose to walk in it. Sometimes we become too civilized for our own good. Sometimes we become too cultured for our own good. And we, we relegate these charismatic experiences to just certain prayer meetings and certain prayer nights because we don't want to be considered weird. I want to tell you, God is bringing us back to a place where we will live in the reality of heaven, where we will live in the reality of the world. You can't, in the reality of the word, where we will live in the reality of the Holy Spirit. God is calling you deeper. He's calling you deeper to live in this way. And as they spoke in tongues, the Holy Spirit gave the interpretation. And the people each heard them in their own language. I want to say it again. Never apologize for the Holy Spirit. Never apologize for the Holy Spirit. Some of you will be tempted to do that. I've had times where in meetings where the Holy Spirit was being poured out. And I looked and half the room was confused and half the room was angry. And the few that were on the floor were the ones getting touched. So what do you do in that kind of situation when you're leading a meeting, when you're a pastor, when you're a missionary, and you look in the crowd, is they they don't know what to do. Never shut it down. One of the things I learned from uh, one of the mentors in my life is John Arnott. And he's been down, I don't know if you know him, he was the pastor of the church that received the the revival in, in in the 90s. And he's been coming to Mexico with us for the past couple of years and doing revival conferences. And I got radically impacted by the Holy Spirit up there in Toronto. But he, uh, he was sharing with some of our leaders in Mexico about his, the first revival that they had. Their revival in Toronto was incredible. An incredible move of the Holy Spirit that went all over the world. They said five million people, they recorded five million people came through their church in the course of about ten years. Uh, they had nightly meetings six days of the week. And uh, nightly meetings with thousands of people in attendance. British air, airlines had to, uh, had to set up an entirely different flight route. Uh, to have, they, they added another two or three planes to the flights coming to Toronto because of the revival. So it went all over the world. And amazing, great, amazing moves, move of God there. But one of the things he said, he said, you know, you probably didn't know this. He said, but I had a revival before Toronto. And he said, and I killed it. I'm like, what? So he's sharing with our leaders. I said, tell us the story. And he pastored a church in a little town called Stratford. And in this town, he was, he was leading this church and he'd had a church was a couple hundred people. It was, it was kind of starting to grow. It was a good charismatic sort of church. And the, uh, one day the, the Holy Spirit broke out in their youth group 
And there were young people on the floor shaking and laughing and all the manifestations that have become common now in the renewal. It was all happening there. And all these things were happening and people getting wrecked by God. And he didn't know what to do, so he just kind of went with it. And then the elders came to him and they said, elders and the leaders from their denomination said, listen, this, we don't think all of this is God. So we need you to shut this down. And so he said, he did. He did. He, he, he tried to shut down what he thought was over the top, what he thought was flesh, what he thought was even demonic. He tried to shut it down. And as a result, the, the manifestations completely stopped. And he said the Holy Spirit withdrew from their church. And he said for years after that, he's, he was repenting to the Lord and saying, God, forgive me. And if you'll ever give me another shot at this, I promise I will not stop the move of your spirit. I will not try to control it. One of the things the Holy Spirit hates is when we try to control Him. He hates it when we try to control Him. You we are not called to control the Holy Spirit. That is not the order that Paul talked about. What has been taught as order in the American church and the Western church is where we try to control the Holy Spirit basically to accommodate for the flesh. But the true move of the Holy Spirit is where the Holy Spirit controls us. And we submit ourselves willingly to Him and we ask Him. When something happens we don't understand, we say, what do we do? What do we do? I've had that in meetings before where we're like, what do we do? So with John Arnott, they had this amazing move of God and shut it down, lost it. And a few years later, when he started the church in Toronto, it happened again in Toronto. And this time when the elders came and the leaders from their denomination came and said, you need to stop, he said, I will do a lot of things in life, but I will never stop this. And as a result, their revival lasted 10 years and resulted in thousands and thousands of people being saved and, and churches. Iris was a, really was a hugely impacted in that revival. Heidi and Rollin, that's where Heidi and Rollin were impacted in the Toronto revival. And then after that, the revival in Mozambique came forward. So, but think what would have happened had he shut down the second revival. Guys, we never need to try to control the Holy Spirit. But how do we handle it when people, when things are happening that people don't understand? Explain it. So Paul gets up and he explains what's going on. I'm sorry, not Paul. Peter. Peter, one of those apostles. He gets up and he explains what's going on. And he says to them, he said, this is what was prophesied. And he goes through the whole, the whole prophecy, you know it. He speaks to them, shares the gospel. 3,000 people were added to their number. I'm telling you, God is bringing us back to a place where we will have incredibly powerful moves of the Holy Spirit everywhere we go. The church needs to return to the raw power of the Holy Spirit again. To preach the Word, but preaching the Word in the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm. So what did Jesus say about tongues? Did Jesus say anything about tongues? What did Jesus say about it? Mark 16, 17. It was the forbidden passage in the church I grew up in. I literally, I've heard almost every book of the Bible preached, but this, this passage was the one thing I never heard preached. They were too scared of it. Mark 16, 17. It's the forbidden passage in many, many denominations. And it says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they will cast out devils, and they will speak with new tongues. And it keeps on going other things that those who believe will do. So Jesus, when he talked about the commission, this was the commission at the book of Mark. When he gave the commission, he said, as part of this commission, you will speak in new tongues. In the book of Matthew twenty eight eighteen, Jesus sent out his disciples into the great commission that you all know. Go therefore into all the world, preach the gospel to every tribe and tongue, to and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he tells them to go. Then in one of the other gospel accounts, he tells them you go. And as you're going, these are the things that are going to accompany you. These will be the signs that will follow you. You will cast out demons. In a move of the Holy Spirit, there will be deliverances. Sometimes we, 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 we try to, in a lot of Western churches, we try to take it and we try to hide deliverance off in some corner room. We don't really do that. Sometimes if we can, we do. There's nothing wrong with doing it that way. But oftentimes in the moment, the Lord wants to set someone free. Jesus did all of his deliverances in public. And there's, there's, some, there's some validity into why the Lord would have it that way in the church. Oftentimes a deliverance is a sign to the community. We had a man 
um, we had a service one time in Mexico where there were three witches that came into our service. And during worship, uh, we were praying in tongues and the power of God came. And two of the witches realized they were in over their heads. And they took off running, but we caught the third one. <laughs> the third one, fell, I'll say the, the Holy Ghost caught the third one. And the third one fell on the floor and started screaming and started vomiting. So we cast the demons out of them. And they, they laid on the floor and we eventually got the person up. And the person came and said, this is what I came here to do. The three of us came to disrupt your meeting. The others realized what was happening and they ran. But they said, I got caught. And they said, and, and she said, uh, the person said, and the demons have left me. She said, I've never not heard these voices before. And I felt the power of your God. I'm giving my heart to your God. Who gave her life to Jesus. Amazing things. We see this sort of thing happening all the time. And the power, when the Holy Spirit is moving, there's deliverance. There's a man who came in to one of our meetings in Juarez, in Ciudad Juarez. And we were doing a campaign, an evangelistic campaign uh, in a boxing arena. And this man walked in drunk out of his mind. And he comes in, he's got tattoos from head to down to his feet. And he's got all these earrings and piercings and looks just a very, nothing wrong with tattoos, but this guy had, a, it was gang tattoos. He had all over him. And I knew you know, that he was from the gangs and from the cartel. So we asked if, I asked if we could pray for him. He was just drunk. He said, sure, yeah, pray for me. So I lay hands on his, lay my hand on his head and I start to pray. And he screams, your hand is hot. I'm like, good. So I grab his arm and he's trying to get away going, ah! I mean, it was, it was really hot. He said I was burning and I wouldn't let go of him. I had a hold of his head and I had a hold of his arm and he's screaming and I, I've got him good by that point. I, he's not going to get away from me and I'm praying for him. And then he starts to weep and he says, I don't want to kill people anymore. I don't want to be a sicario anymore. I don't want to be an assassin. I don't want to kill people anymore. I don't want to do this. I see their ghost every night and he rips his shirt open and he's got all these tattoos. And he said, these tattoos are all for people I've killed. He was covered in him. He said, I don't want to kill anymore. I don't want to kill. I see their faces every night. I can't sleep. I'm tormented. I looked at him. I said, Jesus can set you free. And he raises his head and his eyes had turned dark. They turned black. And he looks at me and he says, no. And I realized I was talking to a demon. So I, I reached out and he reaches in his pocket to grab a, a knife or a, a gun, whatever he had on him. And I reach out and I just touch him on the head. And the power of God hits him. The only way I could describe it, it was like the hand of God punched him in the chest. Because he flew back and landed flat on the floor and was stuck to the ground and couldn't move. And the angels were holding him down. And he was stuck on the ground screaming, what have you done to me? What have you done to me? And all these profanities screaming, what have you done to me? And I said, we're going to take the demons out of you because you're full of the devil. And we're going to cast him out of you. So we cast the demons out of him there. The man sits up, he looks around, he's sober, in his right mind. He looks around and he, he says, I want to follow Jesus. And he gave, gives his heart to Christ. This was actually at a children's event was the funny part. <laughs> oh, so Jesus included includes this in the commission. Who... Oftentimes, we try to preach the gospel from a very intellectual perspective. But the gospel must, is, is spiritual because God is spirit. And the gospel must be received in spirit. And when we live a life in the spirit, we will preach a gospel of the power of the Holy Spirit. Hey, so Jesus thought it was important enough to include this gift of tongues in the very commission. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, 4 through 8, it says, And they were sent, he assembled them together, and he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but should wait for the promise of the Father. Which he said, You have heard me say, For John baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. And when they were there, and then they come together, they asked him, Lord, when will you restore the kingdom of Israel? And he says, Not for you to know the times and place. I love that. Because we get all stuck up in prophecy and well, what, what time, what, what's, where are we at in prophecy? The reality is, Jesus said, it's not for you to know that, but you shall receive power. He changes the subject back to what is the real subject. He says, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the very ends of the earth. So when Jesus said, you'll receive power, it was the word dunamis. 
In Greek, it was the word dunamis. And in, in, in the book, of, in the Great Commission, when he commissioned his disciples, he spoke about authority. And that was the word esusio, esusio. And the husio means jurisdiction. It means you to have a legal grounding, a legal authority in a certain place. So Jesus was saying all jurisdiction, all authority, it was a legal, a legal term. All authority in the earth had been given to Jesus. So he commissions us. And in the commission comes the authority. And the authority is based on our position with the king. When you have authority where the king sends you. But I want to warn you, if you send yourself, you don't have authority. But if the king sends you, you have authority. You are backed by the full authority of heaven. You do not have to fear anything when you are being sent by the king. Because when the king sends you, you have all authority that Jesus has been given. Is You are backed by that. And every one of us as believers have authority. One of the keys to doing deliverance is to understand that you have both power and authority. And to walk in both power and authority. Demons are not interested in how loudly you can scream. There was a man one time we were praying for a young man in Juarez. And I'm sorry, no, in Reynosa. He comes into our meetings, came into our meetings. He was homosexual. He was dressed in women's clothes. And uh, so as he comes into this meeting, he sits in the back and he immediately begins to manifest a demon. He was a, had a distracting spirit to try to distract, the, distract everyone. And he was back there laughing. And, but it was not a Holy Spirit laughing. It was a demonic laugh. And he sits back there in women's clothes and women's jewelry. And he's in the back and very obviously in living a life that is contrary to the Bible. And he's sitting back there in the back just mocking and laughing everything that was going on. Well, I don't like demons laughing in my meetings. And so we, I, I was preaching, but I had my eye on him. I'm like, as soon as I get done, I'm coming after you. And I'm watching him. Like, as soon as I get the chance, well, the, the, our, our team had already beat me to him. And they'd taken him outside and they were praying for him. And this was the picture that was happening. He was fighting them. He was out of his mind. He was snarling. He was growling. He was trying to bite them. So we went into it in good old-fashioned Pentecostal style. In the name of Jesus, that means volume, basically. If you're going to do African Pentecostal or Mexican Pentecostal, it means loud. And so we were going loud. And so we were like, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Cristo, vete ahora, in the name of Jesus. Come out of him now, demon. Come out now. So we were doing it that route. After about 20, 30 minutes of that, the only thing that happened was we lost our voices. And then we're trying to do deliverance like this. And we sound like Lou Engle, you know, and we got the... <laughs> But without the power and authority and prayer. <laughs> and we're trying to do it. We lost our voices. So then we thought, you know, I, I remembered you know, some of the inner healing people. And I'm like, well, let's try it this route. But the problem is, you can't counsel a demon out of someone. You can't counsel a demon out of someone. Where counseling and where inner healing is, is so powerful is because you are ministering to the person. But when the person is out of their mind and you're dealing with a demon, you cannot counsel a demon out of someone. So one of the things to recognize is inner healing is a powerful tool, but it is a tool. It is not the fullness, it's not the fullness of what it means to do deliverance. Neither is deliverance, neither is deliverance um, the only tool you have. It's a tool as well. Sometimes when we do counseling, the purpose of counseling and ministry and inner healing is actually to close the doors where the demons were entering in from to begin with. So we tried it that route. And we're saying, in the name of Jesus, you know, we command the Spirit, come out, come out with us. And we were trying to go that route. Nothing happened. And then one of the Mexican pastors gets the bright idea to take a bottle of oil. And he pours out a bottle of oil, and the guy, glug, 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 glug. Well, at that point, we've got a slippery, wet, demon-possessed, homosexual boy who's over there, God, and now he's slippery. And we can't hold on to him anymore. He's trying to bite us, and he's over there fighting, and he's having that demon's having fun. He's laughing, and oh, and at that point, he was just greasy. We couldn't hold him on to him anymore. <laughs> and my wife walks up to me and sees the spectacle, and she comes, and she's, thank God for wives. Thank God for wives. There's sometimes they, they know a lot more. They're a lot more discerning than we are sometimes. And she comes up to me and she said, I feel like the pastor is supposed to give him the hug of the father. Yeah, you say, wow, now. I, lo- I was looking at the condition of this poor kid. 
He's over there, uh, snarling, eyes rolled back in his head, snarling at people, trying to bite us, growling, yelling obscenities in Spanish and laughing at the same time. And then he's covered with oil. And I'm looking, and dressed in women's clothes, and I'm looking at this going, I have to tell this Pentecostal pastor, suit, tie, hair, perfect. I've got to tell this old Pentecostal pastor to come give this boy a hug. I wish I could tell you that I told the pastor to do it. I actually told my wife, I was like, if God shared this with you, you should tell him. (laughs) And so my wife goes and shares it with him. And the man says, I'm so tired and I'm hungry and I'm ready for this to be done. I'll do anything to end this. That's literally what he said. So he's motivated out of a great level of love. And he walks up to the boy though. And the Holy Spirit comes on this man, walks up and everyone lets go of him. who had been holding him down and trying to restrain him. And he walks up and he just puts his arm around this, this young man and he embraces him. And he says, receive this hug in the name of your father. And all of a sudden, the demons, for the first time, start screaming in panic and terror. And the demons left him in that moment. Mm. And the boy came to, or I say boy, he was a young man. Young man came to, he looked around, he looked, he had no idea why he was covered in oil, no idea what had happened. But he looked at him and he immediately, without us having to say a word, he began to take off all of the women's jewelry. He began to take it off. He began to put those things aside. And he said, I'm a man. I'm not a woman. And that that confusion, that identity confusion was broken off in that moment. Why? Because we heard a word from the Lord. And the power of the Holy Spirit manifested in deliverance. Some things you cast out with... You know, I have nothing wrong with a good African style or Mexican style deliverance where there's a lot of volume. If it works, it works. But the reality is demons are not interested in how loud you can yell or even how well you can quote scriptures. They are interested. They see whether you carry authority or not. And authority comes from having a word from the Lord and being able to put that word from the Lord into practice in that moment. Authority comes from having a commission from the Lord. When God commissions you, you have authority. But God calls you to have both authority and power. That's why Jesus didn't end with the Great Commission. He followed it with the continuation of that, which is the beginning of Acts chapter 1, where he says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and then you will be able to do what I've told you to do in the Great Commission. You need the power. If you want to walk in the, and, and, and be a gospel witness in the darkest parts, parts of this world, Or the darkest parts of your country. You need to walk and live a life in the power of God. Praying in tongues is so incredible because it actually builds you up in the spirit. It's the only gift that is meant to edify you. So I want to spend a few minutes and I want to talk about why we pray in tongues and what happens when we pray in tongues. So what are the purposes of this gift? I think... A good number of you probably speak in tongues, but maybe you haven't, some of you maybe haven't spoken in tongues for a while. And I want to tell you, sometimes we devalue that which we do not understand. So tonight, what I want to do is I want to take us a little bit deeper in our understanding of why we're baptized in the Holy Spirit and why we pray in tongues. So I've got a few points that I would look through Scripture. There's actually somewhere around a hundred different benefits and reasons why you pray in tongues. But for the sake of time, I'm not going through all of those. So there's, I'm just, I've picked out some of the key ones that I've seen in Scripture. And I want to teach a few minutes on these points. So one of, what are the purposes of tongues? One, one of the first things it does is it brings refreshing to your life. It actually refreshes you when you pray in tongues because it refreshes your spirit. Go with me to the book of Isaiah 28, 11 through 12. And it says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to these people. To whom he says, this is the rest wherewithin you may, we may, you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, but yet they would not hear of it. That is Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaias, 28, 11 through 12. Think about this for a minute. For with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to these people. To whom it is, whom I will say... This is the rest that will cause the weary to rest. Think about this is this is many years 
before Pentecost. And then, but, the, but Isaiah was prophesying, he was foretelling what the Holy Spirit would do and how the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon us and what this gift of tongues would look like. One of the things that oftentimes confuses people when they're baptized in the Holy Spirit is they're praying in tongues and it, it, it just, it doesn't, your mind doesn't understand it. And you're just like, what is it? Accomplishing when I pray, what is this actually accomplishing for me? But let's look at what scripture says for with stammering lips. It's interesting, God will use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So it's just like God to give us a gift that is a gift that sounds like the stammering of lips and an unknown tongue. To be the very thing that actually refreshes us and sp- where God will speak to us and will give us rest. I'm telling you, if you're going to be serving as a missionary, as a pastor, as a leader, or just as an on-fire Christian, you are going to need to find a way to rest. So how do you rest when in a time where you're extremely busy? The gift of tongues gives you the ability to pray in the Spirit on all occasions and live a life where you are refreshing yourself in the Holy Spirit no matter what's going on around. I work, I work a long day. Every day of the week I work, I work long days. We have six Sunday services. And I I don't preach them all, thank God, but we have like six Sunday services because of space. We don't have space for everybody. So we have to do a lot of different services in different parts of our city. We, we're busy. I'm busy from sun up till sundown. But I'm telling you the secret that God showed me years ago to be able to stay intimate with the Holy Spirit in the midst of crazy, busy ministry is this gift of tongues. Because when I'm not talking to a person, I'm praying in tongues. This is something I learned. I've seen it from other men and women of God who lived a life, who begin to develop a habit, to begin to develop a pattern of praying in tongues at all times. Praying in tongues consistently. And the more you begin to do it, the more it refreshes you in the Spirit. Because what happens is God takes what we don't understand and He bypasses our mind and He goes and ministers directly to our spirit. Because when we pray in tongues, it is like a refreshing for our spirit. What is being refreshed when you pray in tongues? It's not necessarily your body. It's not necessarily your mind. So you need to take rest. You need to take care of your body. That's important. But when you are being, when you're praying in tongues, it is actually your spirit that's being refreshed. Have you ever been so tired that, so tired that even your, your spirit feels tired? You ever been that tired? That's very dangerously close to burnout. When you're so tired that your body, mind, and soul, and spirit are so are, are mentally, spiritually, emotionally exhausted, that's burnout. Many missionaries reach burnout. I'm telling you, many people start well. Very few people finish well. So how do you be someone who finishes well? Begin to put the gifts of the Holy Spirit into practice in your everyday life. How are we doing on time? Okay, so refreshing. We need to be refreshed in the Holy Spirit. We need to be built up in the Holy Spirit. And let's talk about the next point, surrender. When you pray in tongues, it is an act of surrender. It is an act of deliberate surrender to the will of God. So I want to do a quick little analogy. I'm going to do a quick little uh, example here. Can I get six volunteers? Six volunteers. All right, one. Come on up here, quick, quick, two, three, uh, four, and oh, I need one more. Did I say, yep, all right, and sorry if I said, yeah, I said six, I meant, yeah, I need one more, one more right here, please. All right, so we're going to do a quick little example. Every one of us have three parts in our, in our, in our being, we're three parts, we are body, soul, our body, which is our physical body. It's the flesh. It's the, the body. It's what you can see, feel, touch, hear. Then we have our soul. And our soul is not the same as the spirit. Your soulish realm is your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's, and so then you have also the spirit. So I need you actually to come right over here, please. All right. So the, let's say, for example, in this analogy, this is one person. But it three parts. So in the same way God is three in one, 
we were created with a spirit, which is the part of us that connects with God. So in this example, this is your spirit. And for this example, this is your mind, your soul, your, your mind, will, and emotions. And then this is your body. All right? So now we have God the Father. And God the Father connected, created us. <laughs> Uh, God the Father created us in His image to have a relationship with Him and to be connected. I want you guys just to just to hold hands and be connected. And the, the Father is connected. That God the Father desires to connect with you with your spirit. So when Adam and Eve were created, this is how Adam and Eve were. They were in complete union with themselves. Adam and Eve were they were mind, so, or their mind, or their mind, um, spirit, and body. It was all in, in unity. There was no sin in the picture. And they were connected with, the God, with God. I want you to go and just be connected with them. And I want you all three just to face this way. Face, face God. All right? No, 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 no. You can all stand. Stand this way because just face. Yeah, face there. That's fine. You don't have to hold hands. That's fine. All right. And then this we have is the world. No offense. This is the world. The world is not bad in and of itself. The world was corrupted because of sin. So at the fall, Satan convinced Adam and Eve to sin against God. God told Adam and Eve, in the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. You'll die. But what died? It wasn't Adam and Eve's body. Not in that moment. They eventually died. But Adam's body didn't die in the moment. His mind did not die in the moment. What died? His spirit. So I want you to die real fast. All right, good. Good quick death. So the spirit dies. What happens? The connection is broken. The connection between God and man is broken. You still have your emotions, your mind, your will, your emotions, your soulless realm, but you've lost the connection. So I want you guys now to turn and face the world. So now we have the carnal man. The carnal man who doesn't know God. Who doesn't know, can't know God. This is how you are before you're born again. You cannot know what you cannot understand. Your mind can only comprehend the things of the world. And so what you see happening here is this is the condition of fallen man. But when Jesus came, he came and died on the cross. And he resurrected your spirit man to newness of life. And reconnected you. Now, but I want you to face here. Reconnected you. With the heart of the Father. But anyone see a problem? What's the problem? There's a a division. There's a problem within itself. And actually, your spirit man, I need to share real fast. Your spirit man is the one meant to be in, in charge. But right now, your spirit man is weak. You can sit down. He's weak. He's connected to the God. He's born again. But there's something wrong. He's not taking his place of authority. He's not, your your body, your mind, will, and emotions are not submitting to the Lordship of Jesus because your spirit is connected to God, but your spirit is not in the place of authority. So what God desires to do in the process of sanctification is raising up your spirit man and ministering to your spirit man. So the Bible says, he who prays in an unknown tongue, prays not unto man, but to God. And by the spirit, he speaks mysteries. And it also says, Paul said that he, when you pray in an unknown tongue, you build up yourself. When you prophesy, you build up the church. So as you pray in an unknown tongue, and this man is praying in the spirit, what is being edified in him? His spirit. The spirit of the man within him is being edified. And all of a sudden he goes from being Powerless, weak, not knowing the fullness of, able to step into the fullness of his authority, to suddenly now the spirit of this man begins to say to the mind, you will align with the Lord, under the lordship of Jesus. Now mind, align. Body, align. And you see what happens. This is the purpose. This is why we speak in tongues. So at the moment of salvation, your spirit man was raised But when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, your spirit man is now empowered. Empowered to lead. You are called to be led by the Spirit of God. But how does the Spirit of God choose to lead you? He ministers to your spirit. 
The spirit of man within you. Your your own spirit within you. The Holy Spirit ministers to your spirit. Empowers your spirit. And as you pray in tongues, your mind doesn't understand. And your mind has to come into a place of recognizing, I don't understand this, but I'm going to submit to it. Your body doesn't like you praying in tongues because it gets bored. And your body, as you're praying in tongues, and your, your body's sitting there thinking about, what is, this is ridiculous. What is this doing? But the reality is, as your spirit becomes stronger, your spirit will begin to lead your mind, your, 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 your will and your emotions, and lead your body, and they will align because your spirit was meant to be the leader within you. Because your spirit is what connects to God, connects to the Holy Spirit. So this is the picture of where God desires us to be here on earth. How he desires us to live. Thank you guys. A round of applause for these guys. Thank you. (laughs) So praying in tongues is actually a powerful act of surrender. Because when you pray in tongues, your mind doesn't understand. I remember, I don't know about you, but when I first prayed in tongues, I was so excited because I thought, you know, oh, I, I thought I had a tribal language actually. But then when I started putting it into practice more, my mind would be like, what are you doing? You're making this up. This can't be real. And actually I came back to the U S and I had a, a year or so where I didn't really pray in tongues because someone told me, well, this isn't real. You're just making that up. It just sounds like you're stuttering or, or mumbling. And then something within me said, I I don't know if this is real or not. I want to tell you, there's many Christians who are trapped in that. Where people, the the world has convinced you, and your mind has convinced you, and people around you have convinced you that, oh, you know, that that was great that you had that experience, but it's not for every day. Ha, surrender is an everyday thing. God is calling us to live a life of surrender, to live a life of fire. Mm. So surrender. When you pray in an unknown tongue, your spirit prays, but your understanding is unfruitful. 1 Corinthians 14, 14 through 15. So what does Paul say? He said, what, so, so what then will I do? I'll pray in the spirit and I'll pray with understanding. I will sing in the spirit and I will sing also with understanding. So when you pray in an unknown tongue, your mind doesn't understand. And it's just like this analogy. The mind is thinking about other things. But as you choose to pray in tongues, you force your mind to align itself with the word of God. You force your mind to align itself with what God desires to do. The third thing that praying in tongues does for you as you worship, as you pray in the Spirit, is it helps you to actually know and understand the will of God. What do I mean by that? I'll tell you. Romans 8, 28 through, or 26 through 28. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. For when we do not know what we should pray... The Spirit Himself makes intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knows what is on the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints in accordance to the will of God. And we know, this is one of the most misquoted passages of the Bible, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purposes. How many of you have heard that verse? We know that God works everything for the, together for the good. How many of you have heard that verse? Yeah? Everybody. It's on refrigerator magnets. It's on t-shirts. It's amazing. It's a great verse. How many of you ever heard it in that context of praying in tongues? So think about this. When you do not know what to pray, the Holy Spirit helps you in your weakness. So I was in Sudan some years back. And I was going to minister in an area that there was very few churches, if any churches. And I'd been ministering for some years in, a, in, a, in an area we helped plant about 10 churches. And the Lord was opening up a new area of, of that region to us. And the area where I wanted to go was the place they told me the devil lived. And so whenever people tell me that, I'm like, I want to go. And so I always inquire of the Lord. I always ask the Lord, Lord, can I go? And I felt the Lord say, you need to go. And so I told the, the leaders of the churches, I said, I feel like we're supposed to go. And I was working with a denomination back then. And so I said, I feel like we're, we're, I'm supposed to go and take the gospel there and we're going to go preach there. And they said, well, that's the place the devil lives. I'm like, that's exactly why I want to go. And we went round and round. And finally, they were like, listen, we don't want to go with you. 
they were scared. They didn't want to go. And these guys had fought in wars. And they're like, we, we don't want to go, but we'll send some elders with you and we'll send some of the youth. I don't know why they wouldn't go, but they sent their youth. So they sent their youth with me. And I mean, their youth were like almost seven foot tall. So these young guys, but they're like, you know, Dinka and they're really, really tall guys. So they all had spears because of the lions. And so we go, we cross this river, we hike through a swamp and we go and had a backpack projector that we showed the Jesus film with. And so we're going hiking village to village. Believe it or not, I I used to hike and do a lot of things like that. (laughs) Mexican food got to me. I'm telling you, la la comida mexicana es, es una bendición, sí, pero es tiene sus consecuencias. But (laughs) the Lord, uh, you know, took me out and you took me there and I began to go and minister. But I remember coming across the river. It was a big river. It was called the Sabat River. And as we crossed over, we hiked through a little swamp. And as I set my feet in that swamp, I heard, I, I believe it was audible. Because I, it was so loud, it caught my attention. I heard the voice of the devil. And the devil spoke to me. And he said, I am going to kill you. You have stepped onto my territory and I will kill you now. And so I'm standing there in the middle of a swamp in Sudan. Was surrounded by guys with, you know, with, 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 uh, with machetes and, you know, and, and spears and swords and stuff. We all had stuff like that. And I'm looking around and my first thought was just, there's a lot of ways to die here. I'm just, it, it, my mind's funny. That was the first thing I thought. I'm like, wow, there's a lot of ways to die. I started thinking of ways to prevent my death. But as I started going through it, I'm like, there's crocodiles. I'm like, I knew a guy that got eaten by a crocodile last year. And, you know, there's crocodiles in the river. There's snakes. There's, you know, there's rebels. There's diseases. And there's some horrible things going on. There's, there's a lot of ways to die in a war-torn African country. And all I could think was, I cannot prevent this in my own power. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, remember Romans chapter Ah, he spoke, remembers Romans chapter 8, 26 and 20, through 28. And I, I remembered that passage, and fortunately I'd had it memorized. And I remembered that passage, I remembered what the Holy Spirit spoke to the Apostle Paul, where he said, when you do not know what you are to pray for, when the Holy Spirit will help you in your weakness. So I'm telling you, sometimes you do not know what you are supposed to pray You don't have the words to pray. In a situation like that, where you hear the voice of the enemy and evil is right up in your face. Sometimes evil gets right in your face. What do you do when the devil is in your face saying, I will kill you? What do you do? You stand. You stand on the power of the word. And I remember that verse. And for the first time ever, I connected those two. I'd always heard those two disconnected of God working everything out for the good. But for the first time ever, I understood it in its context. Where the Holy Spirit said, the Holy, He will help us in our weakness. When we do not know what we are to pray, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that are too deep to utter. And he that searcheth the heart knows what is on the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints in accordance to the will of God. You want to live in accordance to the will of God? You want to pray the perfect prayer? What is the perfect prayer? The perfect prayer is the prayer led by the Spirit. The perfect prayer is the prayer in tongues. And as you pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for you. So that when you're praying in the Spirit, it's actually God, the Holy Spirit, who is with God the Father, who knows what is on the heart of the Father, inside of you, speaking to you, using through, through your own Spirit. And as you speak in those tongues, you are actually declaring the will of God over your life and over the saints. So as I was, uh, when I had that revelation, it was like a lightning bolt hit me. And I realized this is what this means. And because of that, God will work everything together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes. So I grabbed a hold of that and I began to pray in tongues. At that point, I, I prayed in tongues on special occasions. But at that point, I began to recognize that the gift of tongues is for everyday use. This is not advanced Christianity. This is Christianity 101, maybe 102. And the gift of tongues is not just for a super class of Christians. This is for every believer. So I began to walk and I began to pray in tongues. When I wasn't speaking to a person, I was praying in tongues. 
it kind of freaked some of the people I was, I was with out because they were from a, a different denomination. And so I'm going on, praying in tongues for two weeks. I started just putting that in practice, putting that into practice. I'm like, if your word is true as you've said it is, and I've heard the voice of the enemy saying he would kill me, Lord, I'm going to put your word into practice. So every day, praying in tongues. Even as I would sleep, I was, I was told I was praying in tongues. It dry, it, I found out after I got married that apparently I pray in tongues all night. And it freaked my wife out the first year of marriage because in the middle of the night I'd be saying, shut up, I don't get about it. But it, she, <laughs> she wears earplugs now. But, <laughs> but the reality is your spirit never sleeps. And your spirit is praying on all occasions. So I was walking through the bush and we were showing the Jesus film. People were getting saved. <laughs> Yeah, you shared a room with me, haven't you? <laughs> it's true. And so I, we were walking through the bush, and people were getting saved, and and it was amazing. One night, after about two weeks there, uh, I was in a, a mud hut in the pitch black, dark. And it was it was dark, and we were showing the Jesus film outside, and I was kind of sick. I didn't, I didn't feel good, and I had my water filter that I was using to filter river water. Had it hanging up, a small one hanging up in the roof of the the mud hut. And so I go up to reach and grab for my water filter. And one of, the, one of my friends who was a pastor grabs my hand and he pulls my hand back and he says no. And he reaches and he grabs a, a knife or a machete and he hits something. And bear in mind, this is pitch black, dark. He hits something right above my water filter and a black mamba falls down that had been wrapped around my water filter. And I looked at this and I looked at the snake. I looked at the water filter and I realized... That had been the plan of the enemy to kill me. That that snake was put there by the enemy. There was no doubt. Because how that black snake in a black, in a black night, in a dark night, because black mambas, they call them the two-step snake. You take, it bites you, you take two steps and die. And so that snake had been wrapped around my water filter, and he saw it somehow. Actually, I think he just heard the Holy Spirit. Because he was, he was one of the ones who was really, he, he loved the Holy Spirit. and He loved the move of the Holy Spirit. And he killed the snake. And I stepped back and I realized, God, thank you. You saved my life. I'm telling you something. This is not just something to give you good feelings. This will save your life. Praying in tongues will save your life if you will put this into practice. For God works everything together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes. This is not just some optional gift. This is for everyone. Now, there's a public ministry of tongues, a public gift of tongues, that not everyone is called to give a tongue and interpretation in the, in the church. But every believer, I believe every believer, is called and given the opportunity to speak in tongues. Now, it's our choice whether we receive it or not, but the reality is it doesn't change the fact that the gift is offered to all. So the, it helps us to know the will of God. So when you don't know what to pray, how to pray... Pray in tongues. What do you do when you hear the audible voice of the devil saying, I will kill you? And you, you, will, you will encounter trouble. I can tell you, if you go on the mission field, if you go to the darkest places of the world, or shoot, not even the darkest places, you go to any place in the world, the West, wherever. There's some dark places there too. If you go anywhere, the enemy will not like what you're doing. The enemy, his purpose is to destroy you, to kill you. But if you will rise up in the power of the Holy Ghost and you will begin to speak in tongues and your spirit partners with the Holy Spirit and you are speaking the word of God and you are making intercession, not just for yourself, but you are making intercession for the saints, for any believer. You are making intercession for your family. You are making intercession for your church. You are making intercession for your ministry. You may be making intercession for people in another continent. As you pray in tongues, the Spirit prays through you. See, God desires that everything He does in this age, He does through believers. That He desires to use us. He doesn't have to use us. We don't have to worship because if we don't worship, He can make rocks worship Him. We don't have to, we don't have to preach the gospel because God could send angels. Jesus could appear as he is in the Muslim world to people and as a man in white and people are becoming born again. An entire village is becoming born again. We don't have to do those things. But the reality is this is how God is choosing to move. He chooses to use you. 
He chooses to use your intercession. He chooses to use your prayer. He chooses to use you to preach the gospel. It is a privilege to be used by the king. It is a privilege to be used by Jesus. To allow him to use your life. And as he uses your life to set people on fire with the gospel. But in order to be used by the king, you have to live a life in the spirit. Whew. Knowing the will of God. The Holy Spirit is the same spirit that is the spirit of God. In heaven right now, he's also within you. This is why Jesus told us that we are to be very careful and respectful of the Holy Spirit. Never, we're never allowed to blaspheme or treat poorly the Holy Spirit because that is such a precious part of God that he trusts, with, he trusts us with. That his spirit that knows what is on his heart and what is on his mind is placed within us. And then so that the will of God could be revealed in our lives and the lives of people around us. Ha, huh. you need to pray in tongues. This will save your life. Mm. Power. You need, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Young Gi Cho, I don't know if you know who he is or not, but he pastored, um, one, at that time it was the largest church in the world in South Korea. Had an amazing church, a cell group based church. It was huge, an enormous church in South Korea, very focused on prayer and worship and missions. They sent missionaries all over the world. He was invited to speak one time at a Baptist church planting convention. And a church in in the United States, in Texas, actually, not too far from where I live. And he was invited to speak in this convention. And the the organizers of the convention, it was at a huge Baptist church in Texas. The organizers of the convention said, listen, Brother Cho, um, we, we know that we have some differences, that you are much more charismatic. But listen, we don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit like you do. We just want you to talk about, talk about church planting and leadership. Don't talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And please don't talk about tongues. They told him that right as he was about to get up on stage. And had a whole different, whole, all of his message prepared. So he gets up and this is what he says. He said, I have, have no shortage of church members. And I have plenty of money. And I've been told not to talk about tongues here. But I have to tell you the reason why my church has grown. Is because I spend between four and five hours every day praying in tongues. See, he recognized what we need to recognize. You cannot connect, disconnect church growth, growth and ministry from a life in the Spirit. You cannot divide those two. If you want to walk in the power of God, you need to be able... You need to be able to live in the Holy Spirit, to live in the place of the Holy Spirit. As you pray in tongues, there is power. There is power that will come out of your mouth. And we talked a little bit more about that earlier. And I want to talk about, I've got two more points. The next thing is, when you pray in an unknown tongue, you are actually declaring the gospel over yourself. You are declaring the mysteries of the gospel over yourself. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and 4. It says, For he who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto man, but unto God. For no man understands him. Howbeit, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. This word mysteries in the Greek is the same word elsewhere that Paul uses to talk about the mystery of the gospel. So this is not, when you pray mysteries, sometimes we think, ooh, mysteries, what is that? The reality is the mystery of the gospel is not an unknown mystery. It is a known mystery because the gospel was a mystery made revealed unto us. But I'm going to tell you something about the gospel is the gospel is so much deeper than our understanding. What and this mean, and let me explain it this way. What it was accomplished at the cross, we have a basic understanding of that, meaning that we were born again, we were saved, our sins were forgiven at the cross. But also at the cross, Jesus desired to transform us down to the very deepest levels of our soul, mind, body, and spirit. What was accomplished at the cross was a great mystery that was not understood before, but was made revealed through Jesus Christ, how God would send salvation to man, how God would restore, and how God would send His kingdom to this earth. That is the mystery we declare. So when you pray in tongues, you speak a mystery, meaning it's something your mind doesn't understand. But as you pray in tongues, this mystery, this mystery of God becomes revealed to you. 
I want to tell you, if you want to understand the word, you need to spend time praying in tongues. Because it will actually deepen your understanding of the word. How so? Because the word is spiritual. The word is spirit. And in order to understand what is spirit, we must live in the place of the Holy Spirit. So praying in tongues, you are not declaring something unknown over yourself. You're actually declaring the word of God over your life. You're actually making a powerful declaration in a language that your mind doesn't understand. You're making a powerful declaration over yourself. And God reveals it. And God reveals the. These, this, these, these, these things to you. And then Paul goes on to say, He who speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Tongues is the only gift, the personal gift of, prayer, of your prayer language. It is the only gift I've found in the scriptures that is meant specifically to build you, or I, to build you up. Every other gift is meant for other people. When you operate in the gift of prophecy, you are prophesying to someone. You're not usually prophesying to yourself. If you're prophesying to yourself, I mean, it is okay to hear the word of the Lord for yourself. But an actual gift of prophecy is usually for someone else. For it to be a word that God reveals, it, he wants off in, in, for, to the body, it needs to be for someone else. Healing is usually you pray for healing for others. You, you can pray healing on yourself. But the reality is that we need each other. And we pray for healing for one another. We're called to anoint with oil and pray for healing. But this gift of tongues, it builds you up. It has a purpose, and that purpose is to build you up. So that brings us to our next point, or really our last point. And that is that God uses this gift of tongues to build you up in your most holy faith. To build you up in the Spirit so that you will be able to stand and stand strong against the warfare that the enemy will put against you. So when you pray in an unknown tongue, you edify yourself. That's what Paul says. Let's talk about this word edify. In Greek, it's the word apokotomeo. And it means to build up or to construct. It is a construction term. It's not a, spirit, it's not a spiritual term. It's not even a religious term. It is, it is a construction term. So as you pray in tongues, you are edifying, you are building something. But what are you building? Where are you building? You're building something in your spirit. You're building a foundation in your spirit. You're building yourself up. You're building a structure whereby you can host the presence of the Holy Spirit in a better way. Think about it in these terms. When the Holy Spirit was poured out on mankind, the tabernacle of God was no longer the, the temple in Jerusalem. And we honor, we love Israel, we respect Israel, we believe, we believe they're God's chosen people. But the tabernacle of, of God was no longer the holy place of God was no longer in the temple because when Jesus died, the ta- anyone who would believe in him, in him, we became temples of the Holy Spirit. And his spirit was poured out upon us and the Holy Spirit choose, chose to live in us. So when we pray in tongues, we are building ourselves up in the spirit to better walk in and carry the anointing of God. We need to prepare ourselves for carrying the anointing of God. We cannot treat the anointing of God as something something light or something unimportant that we choose to walk in one day and the next not. The anointing of God is precious. The Spirit of God is precious to us. We need to honor the Holy Spirit. And as we pray in tongues, we are speaking to the foundations within us, the foundation of our spirit and building ourselves up. And as you build yourself up, you are, it is easier to stand against the work of the devil. Let me explain it this way. Go with me to the book of Jude. Tiny little book of the Bible. It has a very powerful key. Book of Jude, 1, 17 through 21. It says this, But beloved, remember, you remember the words which were spoken before, the, by, the, before by the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last days who should who would walk after their own ungodly lust. These are men who separate themselves. They are sensual men. They do not have the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on and says, But you, beloved, build yourself up in your most holy faith. But how? By praying in the Spirit. But you, beloved, I'm going to say it again. But you, beloved, build yourself up in your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourself in the love of God. 
looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Another translation puts it this way. You, beloved, are not like those carnal men. See, it's interesting that when you read the book of Jude, it talks about carnal men. And he's actually talking to the church. He wasn't talking to the world particularly. He was talking about false teachers that would rise up within the church. And he compares the, the carnal Christians and basically the, what he, how he describes the carnal Christians, in quotation marks, is this way. They are sensual. They follow the flesh. So remember the analogy we just did. That was a Christian. But who was leading the show? The flesh or the mind. Spirit was weak. So when God spoke this to Jude, he was talking and he was drawing the line and saying this, that there would be men who would be carnal Christians. The real danger in the church, I believe, that is not that the devil is going to come in and roar and scream. He doesn't come to you and say, I'm the devil and I'm here to kill you. He brings in subtle deception. But how can he deceive you if you've been fall, if you're, if you're following Christ? How can you be deceived? Can you be deceived? Absolutely. Especially if you are a carnal Christian who is not led by the Holy Spirit. See, the real danger in the church, I believe, is a carnality. A carnal Christian that is devoid. Actually, the word in, in the Greek was, these men are devoid of the Spirit. They have, their, they follow their own lusts. They follow their own desires. But then he says, you, beloved, you are not that way. You, beloved, build yourself up in your most holy faith. But how? Build yourself up in your most holy faith by praying in the Spirit. And keep, that will keep you in the love of God. So there's something about praying in the Spirit that builds you up and actually keeps you in love with Jesus. This is what Jude was saying. This is the revelation of what Jude was speaking to us. You want to stay in love with Jesus, you've got to live a life in the Spirit. For your spirit to stay in love with Jesus, you've got to make a choice. And there are certain disciplines we need to put into practice in the Christian church. Discipline's not a bad word. Discipline just simply means that we submit our lives to Jesus and we choose every day to follow what He has told us to do. So as you will begin to pray in tongues, you will find that you are keeping yourself in love with Jesus. I'm telling you, it's easy to fall out of love. When Jesus spoke to the church, the different churches in the book of Revelation, to some of them he, re- he rebuked them because of immorality. But to some of them he rebuked them because their love had grown cold. They'd forgotten their first love. I'm telling you, when you it is, it is very easy in ministry to become distracted by ministry. Intimacy with Jesus brings us to a place of fruitfulness in ministry. And fruitfulness in ministry results in more work. And more work means we have less time. And less time to spend with God means we can oftentimes let our love for Jesus grow cold. So what is the gift that can sustain us even in the busiest seasons and the busiest times of ministry? Living a life in the Spirit and praying in tongues. So it doesn't matter how busy you are. If you will begin to put this as a practice in your life, you will begin to build yourself up in your most holy faith. And making a deliberate choice to stay in the love of God. So let's talk the ultimate goal of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes I've been in churches where it was so, the gift of tongues was so pushed on people that people would say, well, you know, I can be baptized in the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues. And they're afraid. They were afraid. I've met people that said, you know, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I never spoke in tongues. Biblically, you see that there was usually an example of them speaking in tongues. But I'm going to go a little deeper, and I'm going to say this. The real fruit of a baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just tongues, but the real fruit of a true baptism of the Holy Spirit is a change and transform life. That is the goal. The goal is not that we speak in tongues. The goal is that our life be transformed. But what is the tool, one of the tools that God gives us so that our life will be transformed? He gives us the gift of tongues. He gives us the gift of His Spirit. So you can't separate it from one from another. Hey, why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to do a few things. I feel like there may be some people here who've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And God wants to baptize you in His Spirit tonight. So we'll do a couple altar calls in a minute. 
I want us just to pray in the spirit for a little bit. But before we start, I want to ask, is there anyone here who's never been baptized in the Holy Spirit? You've never spoken in tongues. We had someone this morning that got the gift of tongues today. Praise God. Hey, she got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Can we have just a little bit of worship or something? Yeah. Thank you. I want to ask, is there anyone here who's never spoken in tongues? And you want that gift of praying in tongues. You want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Or perhaps that you did it many years ago, but it, you haven't done it since. Maybe you had an experience with God where you spoke in tongues, but it's been a long time. I believe God is saying it's time. It's time tonight. We're going to do two altar calls. The first is for anyone that wants the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's so simple to get it. You just ask. You ask Him. You ask Him to give you the Holy Spirit and He will. You ask him for the gift of tongues and he'll give it to you. So I want to ask, is there anyone that wants this gift? Come to the front. Come now. Come on. Just line up right here. Y'all come up here. Anyone else? Come on.